Hey guys, this is Eric Weingarten with Weingarten Racing. Today's video is about push rods. If you've ever wondered like I did, does a 5 16th push rod actually cost you power versus a 3 8 push rod? Well, I'm going to answer that today because I did dyno test those and I have the answer. At least that one for this combination. Will it tell you today which one's the best one you should use and this is absolutely the best and this is the reason why things happen? No, those answers aren't there. But you will get dyno results for this combination. I'm gonna share as much of the information as I possibly can and hopefully you get something out of this video. If you like these videos and you wanna support my channel, please like and subscribe. But if you're looking at this video and you're like, man, I'd like to have a printed version of that, I have those. So a lot of the data you're gonna to see today is in this book. This is from version one of the dyno test. I did three dyno sessions, each one has its own book. The third one is not out yet because I just got done doing that on Thursday. These are on my website. If you go to wengines.com, there's a link to my online store and you can purchase this book. So what you're seeing today is from version one of the book. So all the weights and stuff's in there. The dyno graphs will be in a book that's not out yet, but I will share those today with you. So you will have answers, but it's not as simple as, well, this push rod or this push rod made more or less power. There's more things to it and that's why they have stuff up here to talk about. So Anyway, um, please support the channel, get a book. It, it really does help with the R&D and to test different things that you guys want to see. Anyway, let's get into it. So for those who are unfamiliar, I had a 406 small block Chevy built. In it. Um, we test different ideas, push rods, obviously. The cylinder heads that were on it are these. Um, so now I'm switching cylinder heads. I tried a whole bunch of different manifolds and tried just different things just to get some ideas of what might change and might, what might happen. Now, it has a solid roller cam, and if you're able to purchase this first book, you'll get to see all the specs with it. So, uh, I should back up. These are AFR enforcer heads, and they were AFR donated them. Um, but, if you ever get into a set of AFR enforcer heads, they're made for a hydraulic roller. So, the spring got changed to a solid roller spring and a titanium retainer. So, beyond that, they're completely stock. But, I flowed the head and weighed everything. So, if you get the book, you would see this because this does play a pretty big part of the whole dyno thing as far as the push rods. So this is it. That spring that I changed to, I have the part number here. That's an AFR 8000 spring. That's this spring. Um, it's a 155 diameter and it has no dampener. And this is the titanium retainer that's used. That's part number 8505. Now I'm giving you all this information because it really does play a part in maybe why the push rod did or didn't do what you thought. Um, I set it up at a 188 installed height, which gave 255 pounds on the seat and 637 pounds open at 665 lift. This is on the intake side. The reason for the 665 is because the cam is actually a 685 solid roller, but once you take out last, you're 665. The exhaust, it was just because of the way things worked. It had a 189 installed height and it's 245 pounds on the seat and 615 open. Um, I should point out, these are measured, so I actually measure them. It's not by calculated using some math. These I actually checked on the spring tester, my Buxton spring tester, to see and confirm those. I also weighed every piece of this. And the reason for the weights is this spring has to control a lot. So force equals mass times acceleration. So if you add more weight, it will hit harder. If you go faster, it hits harder. It has more force. So weighing the spring... The retainer and the lock, and as well as the valve, will give me the total amount of weight that that spring really is trying to control. So, obviously, if this thing was weighing more, if I had more weight, the results would be different. So, what I'm trying to get at is, I'm giving you this numbers just because you really, I'm going to show you results and stuff, but you really cannot say this is 100% applies to everything. Because this weights of these products are probably may not be the weights that you have. So, you could be heavier, maybe you're lighter. So I don't know, it, it just, it's a whole lot of variables. But I'm giving you it just so you can get an idea of how this stuff was pretty light. The intake valve only weighed 106 grams, which the reason for it is because it's an eight millimeter stem, 202 head. The exhaust valve weighed 96.3 grams. The total weight, so if you take the spring, uh, the retainer and the locks for the intake was 274 grams, exhaust 264 grams. And I'm only giving you this, I'm really giving you all this information because you might be looking at this and you look at it and it's like, this is absolute, he said this would happen, it's not a big deal or whatever. You're going to look at these numbers and yours might not even be close to the same. 
This is only one part of the puzzle. This is just the weight side. In my book, you will see, hopefully I have it not on the future page, but in the book I have the cam specs too. There we go. This is the cam doctor report. What this is, is um, you take a cam and there's a machine and you spin the cam and it will, it will spit out all this information. This tells you the duration of each point, but it also tells you how aggressive or how not aggressive your camshaft is. Because this cam, I would call it medium. It's not, there's definitely much milder cams and there's definitely much more aggressive cams that are in the same duration. Don't confuse duration as determining whether the cam's aggressive or not. It's all on how quickly that, lo that lobe is or how quickly it opens the valve and how quickly it shuts the valve. That's how aggressive it is. And that's what that spring would have to control. So this is in the book so you can kind of see, but it's, I would call this a medium one. There's definitely more aggressive lobes and there's definitely milder lobes. So it's right in the middle, but this is a 260, 270, 108, and obviously 665 net lift. The rockers that were used, this plays an important part of all this too, is this. These were, these are just spares, but these are Jessel Sportsman um, shaft rockers and they're exactly like this. And the reason why I point this out is because this may pay, play a part in what happens. The intake has a 300 offset, as you can tell, it's moved over more. That means it's putting the push rod more of an angle. I'm not being extreme like this, because the, the lifter would be down here and the rocker up there. So it's got a little, I'm being exaggerating a lot, but it's got more of an angle here. Now the exhaust, it's more straight up and down. So if your setup was more straight up and down, this might even give different results than having this offset. So this offset would probably make things worse for push rods, um, especially on the intake side. So. And the reason for that is it's going to flex. So as that valve goes to open, it's trying to squeeze or bend the push rod because um, it's trying to open against all that force. And then eventually as that valve closes, it gives the force back and that can cause valve bounce, valve float sort of thing. But that's just some more stuff. I wanted to be open with you and tell you that stuff. Now, what did it do? First thing is for all of our tests, so I, I'll just pull up some random tests. Um, all of our tests, as soon as I can ever get to one of the pages, there we go. We'd really only gone to 6,600 RPM. And I was dynoing a Dudsworth machine. And Gary was like, you know, we probably should just spin it to 7,000 because I want to see if there's going to be a difference because if it's going to happen, it should happen at a higher RPM. So um, we spun the engine to 7,000. The idea being is maybe this thing's perfectly happy at, say, 6,600. But then, because you're speeding up things, force equals mass times acceleration. The more RPM you're turning, definitely the more force is being involved. We should see if there is valve float issues between the two push rods, it would happen at a later RPM. So we turn it, spun it to 7,000. Now, that's not 7,500, and I know that. But remember, this thing is only peaking at 62. Here's the results. Okay, this is 3 8 push rods right here. Get my pen. Um, if you look uh, at 7,000, we made 523.3 horsepower, all right? And don't worry, I'm going to show you an overlay. Here's the 516s, 522.1. And by the way, I should have pointed this out. The push rod that was used, they're both the same exact length, but the intake push rod, the 3 one, looked exactly like this. It had a 210-degree ball. It's a 3 8 wall and was 3 8 thickness push rod. 135 wall, so they're about the thickest you could get. I think they have a 170, but we use a 135. A really thick push rod, 3 8 versus something like this. This is a 5 16 and it was 080 wall. So it couldn't be further from the difference. I mean, they're dramatically different. About the same, 522. But the graph will tell you more. This is the difference. So, and I probably should have wrote this on here, that red line, this is 5 16 The black line is 3 8 There's your difference. Nothing hardly. So, early on I thought, well, when we did this, what I expected to see was uh, with the 5 16 push rod, I actually thought it was gonna be stronger down low. And then let me explain why. I thought because that push rod's deflecting, it would lose duration of the camshaft. And at a lower RPM, I expected to see more torque and horsepower. But then as the RPM went up, because of valve control issues and it's not opening as much because it's bouncing and losing cylinder pressure, I expected it to fall off. 
If anything, I was completely wrong. If we look at the three eighths, that's the black line. Um, well, I guess I was, sorry, yeah. That sort of happened with the 5 sixteenths. If you look, it was just slightly better through this lower range. So maybe there was something with deflection. So it made the camshaft feel smaller, but it didn't do anything at the top. So it, it kind of held that, but not really. I mean, these are so close. You could have said, well, I mean, just to give you an idea, I think these were only like maybe five, if that, and these are within one or two. So from pretty much, let me see, 6,000 on to 7,000 between one or two. But here is like five, which really could be, we, we kept the temperatures extremely close just because this thing was so tight anyway. Um, that's, that's really nothing. It's not that much of a difference. But even if you look when we roll in, I expected the 5 16 to be higher, but when we roll in, the 3 8 was actually better. It could be kind of the dyno grab, but not that much. I mean, we'd done other tests, and they would look kind of like this. So, yeah, that 5 16 maybe is just a smidge better here, but the 3 8 is and the 5 16 you could just overlay them. They're, they're pretty much was a nothing burger is what I'm trying to tell you. So I know you wanted to say, well, one was better than the other. If you look at this, it didn't make much of a difference. However, I do want to say this because I know some of you right now are like, I'm typing because you're an idiot. Um, I always try to run the largest and thickest wall push rods because I had two people, I mean, there's two ideas of thoughts on this. Some of you like the 5 16 is too weak, it's going to flex. But then other people are convinced that because the 3 8 push rod weighs so much and it has a control that way that it's horrible. But that's on the other side. So I've actually heard that a lot. The heavier push rod doesn't matter. In my, in my opinion, you'd be better off always run the, the thickest push rod you can and the widest or largest push rod as well. It definitely didn't hurt anything. But here's the thing. I know as people are watching it, you're going to take this as absolute gospel. The reason why I shared all those weights and all those spring pressures because this was just one scenario. These valves really are extremely light. At 105 grams, that's pretty light. There are... If you're doing a big block, your valve weighs 156 grams. So you're 56 grams heavier on the valve. Um, not to mention, you also have a larger diameter. Typically, I have no idea why. Um, big blocks will be like 1625 spring. So that spring itself weighs more. So now you have way more mass. We're talking like almost double the amount of mass you've got to control. And you've got your 3 8 push rod, 135 wall. And you're like, well, 5 16 worked for you. It should The 3 8 should be fine for me. The other thing is... The length, the longer the push rod, the more it can flex because it's got all that to take up. So if you look at a big block, especially on the exhaust side, that exhaust push rod's way, way longer. Um, then you've got heavier valve train and everything else, and you're opening against pressure. It's going to flex more. And chances are on a big block or anything that's got more valve train weight, this would not have happened. This valve train is extremely stable. So lightweight stuff, um, medium camshaft, this thing didn't have valve float issues. It doesn't look like it's even close to it. This, by the way, is a perfect way in which your power curve should look. You can tell valve float if it starts dramatically dropping off. So instead of having curve, you just wham, start slamming down. This doesn't have that. If we did the same thing again, though, on a big block, you couldn't take this as gospel at all because you would have definitely have had issues um, because of the weight you're having to control. I do not think this would repeat. So this is just one isolated time. And so I know you were like, I thought you would give us the answers. I gave you dyno numbers from what I saw for this combination. But you cannot take it as gospel. Um, if I was to, and, and some of you are like, well, that's no big deal. I'll just put more spring pressure with it um, if I have a 5 16th. So this way I have even more control. Because I've seen that a lot too where people overpressurize it. All you're doing is putting more flex in that push rod too. So what if I had had and gary and i talked about this what if we had a spring like the pack 1225 that had 765 open then maybe that would have changed everything so maybe it would have been fine and three eighths and really bad otherwise there's so many other factors so you can't take this as gospel but i'll say for this for this combination it didn't make any difference so the next set of heads have already started weighing its valve train components it's about 30 grams heavier on the valve and it's about 40 grams heavier on the uh, whole weight of spring, retainer, lock, valve together. 
So it's definitely got more weight, but it will have the same spring pressure because that spring had a dampener in it, the next heads. So then we'll be kind of interesting to see if this actually does. So I do plan to redo this on the next one because now that one's got the same, going to have the same camshaft, but weighed heavier stuff. These results may not be the same. Another factor that could play a part of this is if I'd had even more offset, so if the rocker itself was moved over even more, that would cause it to be in more of an angle and cause more deflection, and this wouldn't have resulted in the same. So it's a long video that you saw 15 minutes here. I'm sorry about it being long, but I want to make sure I cover it in detail. Um, get to this. It, this is what did for me. It may not do it for you. I will revisit it when we switch to different heads because it will also have different springs. And I do not think these results will be the same. If they do, it's because I've got great valve train control. If this happens, it's because your valve train is stable. If your valve train is on the verge of not being stable, it will really be unstable if you went to a smaller push rod. Um, anyway, guys, thanks for watching. I appreciate it, but I do want to leave one thing. So you could stop watching if you want to, but I got to give some credit to somebody because... You know, sometimes companies kind of help me out and I, I just kind of, I got I to gotta tell you this. So, um, I got a new tool. Boom. Uh, I'm about to kick him right off the bench here, but Brunton actually hit me up. I wish I had a sponsor for my channel. I don't have sponsors for my channel, so don't think that I do. But um, Brunt said, hey, would you like to try some of our boots and tell me what you think about them? And I feel bad because it's been like a month and I told them straight up, if they suck, I'm, I'm not going to do anything with my channel. And for those that don't know, I used to work at AG Equipment. And we had 10 to 11 hour days. You had a 15 minute break in the morning, a 30 minute lunch. And then you had a 15 minute break in the afternoon for 11 hour days. So if you do the math, that's an hour off. The rest of the time you're standing. So when we worked 11 hours, really you were on your feet 10 hours a day. Because one thing that for sure would get you fired if you, st if you sat down. So you're, if you're... Stand, if you're working, you're standing up, climbing, moving, doing something. What you are not doing is sitting down. So work boots, I had a, did that for almost five years. I could tell you, you knew exactly what was comfortable, what wasn't comfortable, especially in that time because your feet would kill you. Brunt sent me these. These are soft toe because I don't need hard toe anymore. And I use them for the dyno because I have ruined several sets of my sneakers on the dyno from oil and gas and that stuff from that. They're not paying me to say anything. That's all they did was give me the boots. They're comfortable. I will say they are comfortable. So if you're considering getting new boots or maybe you got a boot voucher for your year, give them a try because I, I am actually surprised that they were as soft as they were. The one thing I'd say about Brun is maybe you guys, just a suggestion for the company, the, their insoles are extremely soft and nice. I mean, they're comfortable. Even though I have a wide foot too and these didn't pinch. I've had some boots where they... Makes it like it almost feels like it's trying to pinch your toe. I hate that. And it gives you an ingrown toenail almost. The only thing I'd give a suggestion for Brunt is you should also include an extra set of insoles. Because for any of the guys that work on your feet, you know your insoles only last about six months tops. Sometimes less. And I would double stack them just to get them softer um, about three months in. So just a suggestion. Anyway, that's all I'm going to leave you with. I don't want to be like that guy. Look, I got this sponsor, whatever. But I, I didn't want to be a fraud. I mean, like take shoes from someone and never talk about them. If they sucked, I for sure wouldn't. But they actually are good. And they're not paying me to tell you this. So anyway, hope you got something out of the video. Um, again, the books are available. The third one that has these numbers aren't there yet. I'm going to be a while before I print that book. Guys, thanks for watching. You guys, remember, I'm no Superman. Take care.